well. I mean, we're really running out of time here. It looks like Steve was very close to the wall that yeah, time. Yeah, he was. This is, this is incredible. This is, this is, this is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you have the feeling something's got to give here or something's got to happen. I can't picture them running in this echelon to the end of the race as placidly as I, I can't believe 21-year-old Al Unser Jr. playing this incredibly pivotal role in these circumstances. It, I mean, it's a sort of storybook situation. The first it? time a father and son running in the Indianapolis 500 together, that has become a father and son story, although one is in first place and the other is in tenth and is five laps down. Yeah, and a critical situation looming up Dick Simon in that red-white car. That there oh, look, look, Steve... Uh, I think he's got it, or does he? He's Boy, they did out. sudden move and he's done it. Oh, he got past Young Al. But Big Al flew by Simon, and but here comes Steve yeah, again. Steve was able to too. David taking off after Big Al Unser, Al Unser Senior. You, you don't think this, oh, this is incredible? Well, this is it. This is the lead. There's the attempt to pass and. Steve has retaken the lead. He has passed the son and then the father. So Tom, suddenly. Tom Steve seeking perhaps, perhaps in his heart, a little oh. a bit of revenge against the Penske team from which he was fired a couple of years ago, presumably for finishing second too many times. <laughs> and he's finished second in this race three times. Oh, I think this lifts it to the level of a morality play. Oh, oh the whole that, thing. That was quite a move by Tom Steve. You almost wonder if concern for his fuel. Jim, I'm just trying to put the pieces together right now. Perhaps he had back to boost down, coasted in the draft of the two Unser cars for a little while, and then turned the boost up, because now that he's by, look at him. He's oh. pulling away dramatically. With no problem. And there's Al Unser Jr. passing his father his again. Father. Not I mean, for position. Not for position. No, no, no. Of course. no. Yeah, yeah. Physically passing yep. the racetrack. Yep. He may well, not maybe even... Figures he if he can get in front of Steve, he can block him for a while. Like that. I know. That'd be tough to do right now. He may not even have meant to go by in a sense. I mean, it was a question of he had the momentum. And it I'll show you, by the way, the, the effect of getting slowed up in traffic, Jim. There's George McNaughty. Thumbs, Thumbs up. up. Great stuff. Less than 10 laps to go in the race. Steve just spreading out that lead. If he has no fuel problems, nothing else happens, it looks like he is going to win his first Indianapolis 500. When Bignotti looks happy, things must be okay. He's a conservative man. Bill Fleming is down with Tom Steva's wife. She's on the pit wall. I'm with Sharon Steva, Tom's wife. Sharon, have you ever been happier when you saw a pass? Yeah, I, unfortunately, I didn't but I know that there's nobody that is any better than Tom in traffic, so I had no doubts at all. You weren't worried then when Al Unser Jr. was blocking him for about four or five laps? A little bit, but I knew there was a long way to go, so... Yep. As we glance up now, there's only seven more to go, and you'll be on the way to victory lane. It'll be a pleasant thing for you. Well, there's her man out there leading the race. What little surprise may lie in store for us in the final chapter of this drama? Who knows? Now there are just three laps to go in the Indianapolis 500. Tom Steve continuing to lengthen his lead over second place Al Unser. Talking about birthdays here, and Al Unser celebrating his 44th today. He's got an 11-second lead. Vignotti again giving him the thumbs-up signal. Great excitement here. Uh, Tom Steva is going to be 35 years old on two three dinner, in fact. So should such it be for him? Well, if he wins it. But, Jim, going back to an earlier fact, he's just passing Chip Ganassi there, who was John Cox's teammate. He's about to pass him. Going back to something earlier, this is a very fast-paced race. And as I said, the last time there was a fast-paced race was 72. Two cars ran out of fuel in the last two laps. Andretti and, I believe, uh, Jerry Grant back then. And, and we could be looking at that here. Uh, no way to know what's going on inside the car, but they know. They probably have a pretty good idea. Well, they really don't. No, not, not necessarily from the pit. I mean, they can have made their calculation, but what you can't tell is how much fuel you save by drafting uh, other cars or used up by running with full boost out in the open. Do you see what I mean? I see what you mean. Is there any way Tom Sneva can have an idea if he's got a fuel problem? Well, the cars, most of them have warning lights, but uh, they're not always very accurate. Uh, 
Anyway, what, what would you do? You know, you're going to keep on, don't you think you're just going to keep on going at this stage? This is fantastic. You know, also, an incredible thing is that Sneva and George McNaughty don't even really get on. Oh, yeah? No, I mean, they rarely mention each other in interviews, rarely credit the other one with anything much. Here's the white flag, one lap to go for Tom Sneva. And he'll win his first Indianapolis 500. This always is, and for him, especially sweet. Steve just continues to pile it on, continues to drive it very close to those walls. Yeah. I mean, we are yeah. seeing a confident driver in full command of his faculties here, Jim. Certainly not slowing, slowing down. Well, after three second place finishes here, he doesn't want any of that talk about ultra conservative driving. He has driven aggressively with tremendous talent and with beautiful technique all, all afternoon. And how sweet it is for him that the two cars in his wake right now belong to Roger Penske. Look at this, the crowd waving to him, and you can hear their cheers about the war of the engine because the checkered flag is out, and Tom Steva, at long last, has won the Indianapolis 500. Al Unser, second. Wow, what a fascinating <laughs> final 20 laps that was. Wave of the arm. That is fantastic, and he did it with very little testing. Jim, he just put it together today. Really, it's the first time he has looked really good this whole year. There he is. He has to bring it home now and tool it into victory lane, where they'll all be waiting for him, but they better get down there. they got a long way to run. Claws growing. Car coming up on the little ramp there. Check it. Whoops, watch it there, Tom. It's like he almost drove off the edge. That'd be a heck of a thing to do <laughs> at this late stage. <laughs> the wreath waiting for him there. The congratulations. First, he's got to get out of that harness, get the helmet off, then we'll see the living man who lies inside all that equipment. Uh, just another moment it's going to take. Let's have another look right now at the pass that won the race for Tom Steva. Al Unser, car number seven. The yellow car in the lead at this point. But about to be leading it for the last instant. This is the perfect slingshot pass. Steva just screams by him. That's the way he did it. We'll talk to him about it when we come back. The Texaco was Sharon Sneva talking there to on the PA system. Bill Fleming, however, is down there. I think he can get a word with... Uh, go ahead, Bill. Go. Tom, one thing that has to occur to you as you took that white flag, can I make it those two and a half miles? Well, I, we had a pretty good idea we could. The light had started flashing on with about five laps to go. But it oh, wait a minute. The, the light, the fuel light. Exactly. The fuel light was on, but I thought we had enough to go the distance of the crew were trying to convince me that we had enough to go the distance and uh, I was just happy to see the white and then the checker. Tom, at any time were you annoyed in trying to get around Al Unser Jr.? Yeah, I was a little concerned about that act. Uh, number one, he, you know, he passed a couple cars before the light went green and uh, and then he made it a little tough for us to get by but uh, you know, you got to give the fans a show for their money and, and I couldn't stand many more heartbeats so I had to go to the front and stay there. Well, you know, George McNaughty wasn't worried at all. He wasn't worried about fuel. He wasn't worried about the fact that Al Unser Jr. was blocking you. He said you had plenty to go, and he said this was your day. He's right. Well, uh, he should have been sitting in my seat, I'll tell you, because it was a little bit more serious where I was sitting than uh, maybe in the, in the grandstands. But we're happy for the Texaco people, and the star ran super all day. Now, when you got a fuel warning light, how much can you just generally bank on? Well, you get a pretty good idea what it's going to do, and uh, it comes on a little too early for this race, but uh, you got to live with it, but it may, makes the heart go pretty hard because the light flashes on and off. Until it comes on solid, you're not in too serious of trouble. Was it on solid? It was the last lap, but... Uh, but you never let up? Well, you can't. you got to go for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you caught the bouquet three times as a bridesmaid. You finally made it to the altar. It feels a lot better, too, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh,